before we get started, Brent, I'm just going to dump the new the new uh, AIO image to this machine so I can okay. show you the all-in-one installer in a bit. It takes about 11 minutes. So, so this is what's going to be a uh, what I call the destructive testing. So I'm going to actually <laughs> have to blow away the, the OS, uh, the boot partition, which basically kind of ruins the machine. I mean, you could repair it from now. It's actually possible, but... <laughs> I could. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else would put the effort there? So this is a uh, this is a destructive test. So I've unmounted that so I can DD to it. Yeah. So DD. This is the big fat 10 gig image. OF equals die. And then that's going to take a while, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's going to take about 11 minutes actually. It's not too bad. Right, right let's do this. So it's funny, uh, in the installer, Brent, the, um, I was playing around DDing the AIO image, this new 10 gig image, and, um, and I realized that the BusyBox implementation of DD doesn't have this feature here, status equals progress. So I was sitting there, I had no idea how long it was going to take, <laughs> and I was just getting really frustrated. So I replaced DD in the Slackware installer with the one from um, Core Utils. <laughs> That's funny. It's like, no, I need to know what it's doing. I've got zero visibility. So, yeah, so yeah. I replaced that. Fortunately, it had zero dependencies, so it's just like a 100K binary or something like that. Yeah. And the installer's already fat enough as it is, so giving it a little bit more flab <laughs> isn't, gonna, oh. isn't really going to uh, rock the boat too much. Hello, and welcome to the Slackware Arm vlog. Um, so I'm Stuart Winter, the platform architect and developer of uh, Slackware on the ARM platform. And we have uh, here with us Brent Earl, who's one of the Slackware contributors on the team. And Brent helps out with research and development and hacking on stuff. Telling me I'll general, break stuff. General, general minion stuff. Minion <laughs> stuff, fixing stuff, breaking stuff, <laughs> asking for things. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah that's what we're doing and what are we doing if you're new to this podcast you're probably already wondering <laughs> what is going on <laughs> given that we didn't start with too much of an introduction um, yeah. what are we doing on this uh, it's, it's actually a vlog um, I, I, I was originally calling it a podcast but I was doing some uh, research on YouTube the other day actually for something and I, and I recognized uh, that really this is a, a v, it's a vlog it's we've transitioned quite some time ago from podcast to vlog so going to update yeah. our terminology now it's just the vlog <laughs> it makes a big difference of course <laughs> yeah, we yeah. have some video we show you terminals and stuff um so what are we what is this uh, vlog about then so uh essentially I'm, i was thinking of renaming it from the you know the slackware arm uh, channel or, or something to the sort of the chronicles of slackware arch 64. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> here's the long story of what happened next and, and that's basically what we're doing um uh, we are building, developing Slackware on the ARM platform, and we're just talking about, uh, now, now that I'm working with Brent on it, um, it happened for the last couple of years uh, since the start of the pandemic. Has it been uh, that long? Stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has actually. I know it's surprising, isn't it? But it actually has. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been, you know, the, real, the, the reason I knew that was because I was updating something the other day, uh, some documentation, and I looked at the dates, and uh, and indeed, in fact, actually, is if I let's have a look because you can see because when did I start? This is the change log. I actually started making the change log from the moment I started porting to the 64-bit architecture. So I actually made an effort of uh, logging the the history of it for uh, posterity. Although yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure I really <laughs> needed to, but uh, I, I thought it was a good idea at the time, and the, the uh, pandemic was driving me crazy. So. Had to do something. So when? So yeah, it began in 2020. Uh, 20, it's almost two years. It's not quite two years, but almost it's getting there. Um, so yeah, what this 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 blog about then is really is sort of chronicling, you know, what we're doing. It's how what are we doing with Slackware on the ARM platform? Um, what are we working on? What kinds of developments are we making? What are we hacking on? What's broken? That kind of thing, really. Um, it is an open source project. Uh, no one, I don't think anyone really does this kind of thing that works on distributions. So. Uh, this is what we're doing. 
Uh, Brent's working with me, as, as we said, over the last couple of years or so, um, and has been helping with uh, develop the 64-bit um, port of, uh, of Slackware on the ARM architecture. Yeah. Um, you know, I realized as well, uh, Brent, that we haven't talked about uh, what Slackware really is on, on any of the recent episodes. Um, I thought we could probably revisit that as well. I mean, I was thinking, you know, what, what is... Uh, because I've been doing stuff for work, I think you know. Yeah, I have to you know position products and like you know here's the various angles of the of, of the story depending on what you're after. You know what what interests you. And I was thinking, you know, we haven't done that for Slackware for a while. And I was thinking again, what? Um, actually, I mean, you're more reason that you're sort of more new to Slackware, aren't you? You only started using it what in you only started it using what, 2015 or so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what what is it to you then? What, what have you made of it so far? Uh, you mean like the purpose of what, what I use it for? <laughs> um, yeah, and also how, what's your experience of using it? Because I know you use other distributions as well and you use BSD and stuff like that. What's... Um, I haven't used Slackware professionally, uh, but in the past I worked with SinOS and uh, uh, Debian at a software company. And so a lot of the stuff I know is from that. And since I started working on Slackware stuff, uh, or at least using it, it's been like a big uh, learning curve and having to learn a lot of stuff because, I don't know, not as much of the things are done for you as they are uh, in other distributions. So, but Yeah. And do you find, how do you find that then? Because, I mean... I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I keep trying to, like... Okay, oh, okay, a new release of Debian. Let's check it out. And I'm bored in like 20 minutes. <laughs> so I just Oh, kinda... right, because you mean you don't need to do so much, so you don't get engaged with the technology yeah. or something, is what you mean. And really, in the end, it's not that much more. You just kind of, if you write like a couple, like some uh, bash scripts and automate things a little bit, it's not really that much more work. I don't know. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought, yeah, no, yeah, I see what you mean. I, I'm just curious because uh, I thought, yeah, we hadn't talked about it for a while, and I don't think I'd solicited your um, experience of it, uh, at least recently. Yeah. So, yeah, because I don't really use any of the distributions. I use Windows and Mac, and that's it. Really. I don't use anything. Um, I come across various like, Ubuntu sometimes in like containers and stuff like that, but I don't play around with it. It's just a it's like a toaster, you know, I make some toast with it. I really care. Yeah. I eat it. I get toast my bread and I eat it. <laughs> so I kind of use yeah. it like that. It's just a, an appliance that it does, does what I want and that's it. I don't spend any time playing around with uh, anything else apart from Slackware. So I, don't, I kind of lost perspective on what other what else goes on. Well, that was kind of where I was at with Debian for a very long time. You know, I would just use it. I wouldn't like, uh, you know, dig in and find mm. like, things to fix or whatever I just kind of used and wait, waited until bugs were fixed and if it didn't uh, have it I pull something from testing or whatever you know so <clears throat> okay yeah oh yeah it's um I wasn't planning on talking about this actually I've been thinking about it but it's not on my uh, agenda <laughs> but it's got yeah, it's got me thinking because I've been doing all, you know there's some more development on it recently I was thinking oh and, uh, and I was looking at how many um, subscribers there are on the channel. This is, at, the, at the moment, there's 496. And I was thinking only, what, a year ago? Or was it slightly more than that, maybe? Yeah, maybe a year and a half ago. This channel didn't, ever, didn't exist. So I was uh, kind of pleasantly surprised to see how many, uh, how many there are and how many, the, how many views there are. I didn't, yeah. know, I didn't really think that many people would be interested in, yeah. in working on, on these types of things. But... Uh, um, yeah. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. So on that, the, the project is um, basically funded by you guys. Um, previously, I was kind of, you know, bankrolling it because <laughs> uh, it wasn't in terms of running it in terms of electricity, it wasn't particularly expensive. But with uh, the prices of all of that going up due to the, you know, the, what's going on in the world, it became expensive. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I really appreciate you guys who have contributed to to help pay for essentially pay for the electricity and, and um, replacing hardware and stuff like that. I really appreciate it because I enjoy working on this uh, on this project and um, it's good to have the engagement as well. So yeah, thanks a lot for that. Um, 
I wanted to, I've got a few things on the agenda, Brent, and we can, I've got, I don't actually have a hard stop this time. So <laughs> I don't really plan on going over an hour, but <laughs> I guess, I guess if we end up doing that, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, people can get their popcorn out already. <laughs> I mean, surprisingly, I think people are starting to watch, uh, you know, the whole thing. You reckon? Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked at the stats, to be honest. Um, I have in the past, uh, but it was more like, like, kind of like eight minutes or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Although, although, actually, it wasn't too bad because, I don't know, I haven't looked recently, but it was, yeah. But I think that's quite common, but, you know, whatever. Um, if people are interested in it, they're interested in it. Um, where was I going to? Yeah, so we've been, so I'd said on previous um, episodes that we were going to move over to the Linux zero, oh, sorry, 6.0 um, uh, branch. And that was the plan. However, the uh, Raspberry Pi, I keep doing that. The Raspberry Pi, um, <laughs> which actually, is this the Raspberry Pi or is that the, Oh, that's the, yeah, that's the Rock Pro 64, I think. So we're actually, yeah. So we're actually inside the, the, the Slack Row installer at the moment. Um, yeah. So what was happening on the, uh, the Raspberry Pi was that the, um, the, let's see, actually has checked. <laughs> Maybe it still is happening. I actually haven't checked. Okay, yeah. All right. Sometimes right. it'll mount, other times it's not even seen, the, the SD card. Yeah, so. what was happening in the previous versions of 6.0 up until .10, so this actually seems to have fixed it, because I left the installer running um, uh, or, or upgraded to I upgraded the kernel within the OS, and almost yeah, within minutes of it being booted, or even during boots, uh, <laughs> the MMC subsystem, so basically the SD card, uh, was being disconnected, reconnected, disconnected. <laughs> it was permanently being disconnected and reconnected to the bus. Um, it was flapping on the bus. Uh, I don't know what, it must have been a software bug, but because it's been fixed now. But basically what that meant was, was that I couldn't deploy, um, or could, I couldn't update to Linux 6.0 on the Raspberry Pi and push out packages because for those of you who'd install it, you'd find your system basically was broken. Either it wouldn't boot properly or it would boot and then when you came to basically slash boot would become unmounted because the because the, the actual storage disappeared off the bus. And so it got unmounted or it hung. Usually it got unmounted. Um, and then that would mean that when you upgraded the kernel, the you'd have fr a fresh slash boot created in the root of the operating system, which wouldn't actually be on the partition. And therefore, <laughs> when your system rebooted, it would <laughs> boot the old kernel and then everything would go wrong because the, you wouldn't be able to find the kernel modules because it was looking, it was it was trying to use an older version of the kernel. If that makes any sense to you guys at all, I don't know. But that's what would have happened. And that would have been bad. <laughs> that's all you need to know. Bad, bad. So that I didn't push out the Linux 6. kernel. And I must admit, I was pretty frustrated and really disappointed with the Raspberry Pi again. But I've learned to live with it. And I thought to myself, you know what? I think it's a blessing in disguise. Because I thought, actually, to be fair, 5.19... Okay, it doesn't for the Raspberry Pi. It doesn't have VC4 driver uh, for the video, but okay, it does actually work with video if you cared enough to use it and put up with it. But it's perfectly rock solid on the Rock Pro 64 and the Pinebook Pro, and so actually it can just stay like that. There's no reason to change it. So instead, I'm now feeling better because it's actually been. Um, uh, it seems to be stable on the Raspberry Pi at least inside the installer. At the moment. Oh, there was another issue with 6.0 actually. So when I when I upgraded the kernel inside the OS and it booted, the VC4 driver gets loaded. Because if you look here, scrap VC4. Uh, yeah, you'll see that uh, the VC4 driver won't load, and that's because it's just missing some of the module that's not present. But when you boot it, when you boot the OS, all of the drivers are ready, uh, rather they're available. And VC4 loads them, and it, then I get the blank. I get a blank, a, a blank screen, so my monitor would be blank. Although only on one of my HDMI monitors it was blank; on the other it was fine. <laughs> so, like, okay, well, previously in 5.19 it was fine everywhere, and now it's only fine on one monitor. It's just like, oh god, can't take it anymore. <laughs> so I thought, you know what? Let's just let's just skip Linux 6.0 in any way. 6.1 will be available within a few weeks. So it just didn't make any sense. Anyway, that's a long story, um, but. We're not going to be releasing 6.0 uh, 
it'll only be 6.1. And I've come to the, the uh, I decided, as I told you, Brent, recently, is that even if 6.1 does not work properly on the Raspberry Pi, I'm sorry, guys, I'll put out a notice, like, go and complain to Raspberry Pi because it's not going to stop the project. If it's if it can't keep up, then it's a, just like the lame duck. Sorry, but it needs to get left behind. It can't it can't hold up progress um, anymore because I've got yeah. some stuff that I want to be doing with the distribution, like which I'm going to show you now uh, or show you soon. Um, and it can't hold that up. The Raspberry Pi is not worth it. That there are the hardware that's more interesting that Brent can talk to us about in a bit. Um, I'm sorry, guys, if that sounds like a bit bit sort of uh, um, harsh. Uh, particularly for you guys who bought Raspberry Pis, I'm not going to remove. I'm not going to remove support or anything like that because eventually it'll it'll work again, I'm sure. But if I find with 6.1 that it just you know there's some problem with the video or it's the F, you know the the SD card's dropping. Out, I'm sorry, I'm going to push out the packages and tell you guys not to upgrade them. So you should blacklist them out with Slack package or something like that um, until such a time. I'll keep on testing it if that happens myself. I'll keep on top of it. I'll keep checking it every now and then, but. You know, I need to move on with 6.1 because I've got other stuff that needs to come out. Yeah. Um, yeah. What were we going to say, Brent? I interrupted oh. you several times. <laughs> I don't know. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah. Anyway, long story about that. We'll be releasing. Oops. We'll be releasing 6.1 though, um, and I hope I do hope that the Raspberry Pi stuff will get fixed. I have seen that some, and well, you've seen actually, Brent, and told me about it. That, you know, there is obviously work going on to fix this stuff because clearly 6.10, 6.0.10 seems to work now, whereas previously only 6.0.9 was failing every single, uh, the, the, the MMC was dropping off the bus. So it seems to already be fixed. So hopefully all these things, they'll all get fixed eventually. It's just a case of, you know, how long do you need to wait really? And a bit of pain on the way. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, okay, let's do this. So the first thing I'm going to show you guys is where are we You're in the install aren't we? Yeah. So, so okay. So I'm currently connected to my Raspberry Pi four, which is the one that you see uh, or whose terminal you see on the screen, and uh, I'm connected to it over serial. Um, so in other words, when I well, my, uh, meaning in this instance that when I reboot it, you'll see the bootloader. So sorry, let's reboot this bad boy. OK. There we go. Um, OK, so I'm just going to interrupt the boot sequence here. OK, so we're now in new boot on the Raspberry Pi. So this is inside of the bootloader. And what I want to show you is. Uh, where is it? Oh, yeah. So. Installer. Now. So this is the um, the root directory of the Slackware ARCH64 current um, tree, and if you so this is yet yeah, the the uh, installer directory here. Now inside this directory is what I call the bare installer. In fact, there's a README here that tells you what it is, uh, or naked installer as I call it in here. Um, so basically, this particular image here, what is it? A couple of hundred megs or something? Three hundred megs or something? Like that. Oh, yeah, 335 megs on this one. So this installer is the what I call the naked or the, the bare installer. And ordinarily, this isn't something you need to do, even look at. Um, but the reason it's included in here is because, um, well, back in the day <clears throat> of 32-bit ARM, the way that I installed it, uh, and the way pretty much everyone did that uh, did it at that time was to network boot things over TFTP. So you'd use TFTP to fetch your kernel um, and in initial RAM disk, and then you boot them. And then the kernel uh, the kernel boots into the well in, in this case it's just the the installer. So it boots into this environment Linux environment entirely in RAM, and then that find you know that sort of explores the the hardware and finds all of the the, the storage and all that kind of sets everything up all that kind of stuff. And then you can install it, and so you can install you'd install Slackware to uh, an SD. You know, you'd install it usually to a, um, a hard drive or some kind of storage uh, like that. And that's how you did it. So you booted off of the network. The thing is, though, is that to do that, you you had to set things up, and um, you know, you had to actually have some 
uh, you have to have, you have to set up a TFTP server and an NFS server in your environment. And actually, there's really quite a few obstacles it, 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 to, to actually install the thing. To be honest with you, I was actually no 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 lie. I was actually really surprised that people followed the instruction guide because I wrote it for myself. Right to me, I already had all, all of those things on my own network. You know, so it was all right for me. Um, but plenty of people followed the, the documentation. But nonetheless, when it came to the 64-bit support, uh, one of the guys, Vince Batts, in the Slackware team had said, you know, wouldn't it be great to have the installer on an SD card? And I couldn't get TFTP boot working anyway. So I said, yeah, it sounds like a great idea, and went down that route, which is what I'm going to show you, the, the evolution of, of which I'm going to show you in a few minutes. But one of the things I couldn't get working was booting over TFTP. And the reason why I liked booting, booting over TFTP with 32-bit ARM was that when you do a major kernel upgrade, say from 5.19 to 6.0 or 6.0 to 6.1, when you do a major kernel upgrade, sometimes things break. Like they, they move things, the storage modules around, and like the, you, you know, one of your modules needs to be uh, actually actually depends on something else which you haven't compiled yet. It it did actually build, but it, it depends on something else and. So you try to boot it and it all falls down, <laughs> stuff like that. So the last thing you want to do, particularly when these machines are remote, but just generally, you, whenever the machine boots, you want it to be able to be working, at least to you know to, to have network and, and you know to be remotely accessible and have access to storage and stuff like. That. Those are the key things. But if, they, if if those are broken, then you kind of like pretty much out of luck, right? <laughs> because if there's yeah. no networking, how do you get access to it? Like it's even the serial port is not that useful. Um, I mean, yeah. So basically. There are other ways around this, but like to me, you need the basic stuff. And so what I would do is with on the 32 bit to test a new kernel, rather to test a main a major upgrade, I would just reboot the machine and boot the installer because the Slackware installer has the kernel modules in it and I'm booting the new kernel as well. Right, So I'm booting a new kernel and it happens to be booting into the installer. And that way I can see if the machine gets lit up properly. I can see if the, you know, the storage arrives on the burst. I can see you know, if the network's there and, you know, H, uh, HCI, that kind of stuff, USB, you know, we can see basically all the, all the core stuff is, is is available. So I think, oh, okay, in that case, if the installer works, then I, I can, I'm probably safe to do a kernel upgrade on the OS. So I reboot the machine back or I, boot, or I just upgrade another machine, whatever. Um, you know, and then I upgrade that, you know, I upgrade the kernel on the OS, reboot it, check it, go, oh, okay, yeah, that works. And then I'll do a reinstall as well on a different machine. So basically, that's how I did it. So that's what I call non-destructive because if so, I, I boot the installer and then I don't I don't delete anything on the on the machine itself. I don't touch anything on the storage. I'm just booting. I'm downloading it off the network and booting it out of RAM. So I don't change anything whatsoever. Not even not even the boot parameters in the bootloader. Nothing at all. It doesn't. So it's, the, the the original installation is completely unaffected. So if I find it all goes wrong, I just reboot it back into the OS and perhaps I change a kernel. Re, you know, recompile something. So it's non-destructive, and it's, it was the easiest way. That was quite a long story. Okay, <laughs> but basically, why am I telling you that story? Well, because with Slackware ARCH64, you can't. Uh, the way it was was that the ins, uh, to boot the ins, because the installer is on a, an SD card rather than being booted over the network, which is far preferable. But that's because that's how it is. It meant that in, in order to test the installer, I had to uh, either you know unmount the boot partition on the SD card, physically remove the SD card, put in a fresh one, you know, uh, copy the, you know, dump the installer onto the SD card and reboot it. So that means I have to physically, like I have to type in command, I have to physically change it, which I can't do if I'm not physically next to it. Even if, even if it was, I can't be bothered anyway. What's the point? Right? It's just work. So the easiest way to do it is to just remotely just, you know, do it over TFTP. And that way it's completely non-destructive and it means I'm allowed, I can just, you know, reboot it if it doesn't work. However, I couldn't do it because I just couldn't get it working over TFTP. So Brent has gone and fixed it and found, and it was actually the really, it was the easiest thing <laughs> just by using all the defaults. Um, I got so used to manually setting the memory addresses in 32 bit because the defaults never seemed to work or they didn't work for the size of kernel and init RDs that we had in, in Slackware. So I was so used to setting the, 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 um, the addresses manually and I couldn't figure out what, which, what the addresses were. I just couldn't find it. And I'd kind of given up a move. And so Brent's fixed this. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is if you look at, um, uh, I'm going to show you booting that because it, uh, because if those of you who might be interested in, you know, um, 
lighting up Slackware onto other uh, architectures, or rather, uh, rather other hardware models. Um, perhaps we'll talk we'll talk about that in a bit. But for those of you who, those of you who are interested in that, this is as I said, it's a really nice non-destructive way um, of booting the installer. And so what I'm going to do, um, this document here uh, tells you how to set this up. I mean, it's quite minimal. It's not going to go into extensive extensive detail, but it tells you how to get going with this, at least on a Slackware x86, x86 system or some other Slackware. So I'm not going to show you that stuff, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to boot the um, installer in, and I'm going to invoke the pre-boot shell as well. And I want to ask Brent for his opinion on something when we do that. So let me go to, so we're back in the Raspberry Pi 4 um, uh, console for the bootloader. So I'm just going to TFTP that. And unfortunately, again, if anyone does know the answer, uh, please tell me because this is really annoying. But basically, in the older bootloaders, uh, your versions of you, but I could just select really long lines and now it doesn't, it truncates them. And fortunately, it doesn't matter too much because I rarely do this anymore. But yeah, nonetheless, that's why I'm taking it slow. That is why I'm taking it slow. So that's that. Oh, that's finished. Uh, see what I mean? I keep took off the last. <laughs> Quite annoying, actually. Is that right? RPI. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh no, I've missed it. Hang on, hang on a minute. Oh no, it's okay. That's fine. PBS. Oh yeah, I just need PBS. Probably should have typed that, it would have been easier. <laughs> so I promise you, yeah, this is just like, just slow. I'm sure there's a fix for this. It could be a config thing, but I just haven't seen it if it is. But it doesn't bother me too much at the moment. OK, let's see. So we we'll download the basically what this does is it downloads a U-boot script, which then um, pulls the um, the kernel and the installer initial RAM disk image over the network into RAM and then boots the kernel. Oh, and it pulls the flattened device tree as well, of course. And it takes a couple of minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, my, my throat's acting up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same here, actually. I've got some water, though. Yeah. So it's funny, actually. So this is quite slow, as you can see. I mean, this takes a minute or something. It's much slower on the Rock Pro 64 um, with TFTP. Um, I, what, I don't, so here's the thing though, I've actually been experimenting around with this. Um, yeah, there we go, that was actually quite fast. Uh, on the, so in Slackware, in the inetd, etc. slash inetd.conf file, that's where you load the, um, uh, that's the, 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 uh, the, the uh, what's it called? The super, the internet super demon or something, I can't remember, something like that. Anyway, <laughs> so in inetd, that's where we start, um, uh, the TFTP server, fr server from. And in the default config, it has this option, I think it's dash R or something like that, it has this option that restricts the maximum block size that the client can request. And I thought, well, what's the point in doing that? Now, I guess it's just because of um, some ancient clients were, had bad implementations and things, you, know, you, you get truncation because it uses UDP, so it can't verify the, the uh, integrity of the data. So I guess that's why it's got that restriction in there. But Patrick didn't know why that was in there, why, why that config was in there. So I removed it and found that when I use curl to download the same the same 300 megs, it, I get 200 over 200 megabytes per second. So it's like just done in an instant. So I thought, oh okay. So and I, I did a you know I did a hash, I made a hash of the of the files to compare them to make sure that they weren't corrupt, and they weren't. So then I changed, I went into U-Boot and changed the parameters to set the block size to the same massive size of, um, uh, or rather the same size that I specified with curl. And then U-Boot broke. It, it tried to download it and everything was corrupt. So I don't know why U-Boot can't handle the larger block size, whereas curl can. I'm not sure why, what, what, why that That's is. I don't make sure. Maybe it's just, I don't know, 
maybe something to do with the stack, the internet stack on new boot. I don't know. Don't know about that much about that stuff. Um, but anyway, I looked into it to try and make it faster, and I couldn't. Is the <laughs> I couldn't make it work reliably. Is the uh, thing. So if you want to experiment trying to improve the speed of new boot, please be my guest and report back if you find that, that it works for you. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't work for me. Okay. So okay. So what I've done this. The installer can the Slackware installer can be used as a rescue environment, and it can also be used as obviously the Slackware installer, and it can be used to explore your hardware a little bit. So what we've done, what I've done here is I've booted the installer and I've added to the kernel command line uh, this option. <clears throat> sorry, this option here called SLK PBS. So uh, that option is interpreted by what's uh, that option is um, considered by the uh, the operating system initial RAM disk uh, RAM disk in Slackware ARCH64. So inside of that, the boot process of the ARM port of this, if you put this kernel, if you supply this config uh, or this this um, kernel command line uh, token, it uh, opens up what what I call the pre-boot shell. Now, what, what the, basically what this does is when you're when you're loading the when the kernel boots up initially there are no kernel modules in it there there are some drivers built into it there are quite a few drivers built in that you really need but there is no the majority of support for the USB for the storage and like various most of the like networking and pretty much everything is built in that they they're, they're, they're uh, built as kernel modules so they need to be dynamically loaded into the well they need to be loaded into the kernel at boot time. And in order to give you maximum control over onboarding new hardware models, you know, making Slackware work on other ARM um, hardware that you find in the market, I built this kind of this pre-boot shell, which basically just, it, it pops up a shell at currently two stages of the boot process. The current, uh, the, the, and the purpose of doing that is to give you control as a developer or a hacker to you know, to start fiddling around with the system. It's basically in case stuff doesn't work that you can fix it. And also to um, to just load extra modules to play around with it, you know, to try and uh, when you're onboarding new hardware, you, you can play around with it at this level. So if, if that makes too much sense, but basically at the moment there are two stages. Currently there are no kernel modules loaded at all, okay? However, what's set at the moment, if we look at the environment, there are a whole bunch of uh, kernel modules, mods like this, right? Now you can't change these kernel modules, um, but these have been configured by what, what, what are called the kernel module loader scripts. <laughs> I'm probably going off on, on the, but this is going to make any sense right now. But basically there's a, whole, there's a bunch of scripts that set, that, that configure these variables. These are just variables. And these, the, this lists all of the store, all of the kernel modules or the software drivers that are required to, to make this hot particular uh, hardware model work. This is a Raspberry Pi. So this is what all these kernel modules are, uh, need to be loaded to make the Raspberry Pi work. It's not entirely true, but it's mostly true. There's some other stuff loaded for things that you might not necessarily use, but that's a different story. But basically, this is kind of it. And um, now the thing is, these are already set. You can, but they're not loaded. So this gives you a chance. If the system is going to break, you can sort of stop packing around with it. Then when you quit the preboot shell, let's, uh, well, actually, before before I do that, here's the question for you, Brent. I'm thinking, Brent already knows how it, how this works. So, but I'm thinking of adding a third, to, of, of actually having three steps. The first, because the, currently, you know, you've got all of these modules that are, they're already set to be loaded, right? Yeah. But I was thinking, <clears throat> wouldn't it be better if we had a third step, or actually a preliminary step prior to the current step, so uh, uh, step one becomes step two. So if we have a new first step, that actually, okay, because basically, if you if you go in here, right, uh, where are we? Okay. Okay. So basically, at this moment in time, the parent process that forked the shell we were just using. The parent process that forked the shell has already processed this config file, and so that's why all those modules that you saw were were shown because it's already pro it's already done this and they're now in the environment ready to be used. Right now, the thing is, is that what if I made a first step where actually 
it allowed because basically look, if we edit this file uh well i don't I, I don't need to show you that. You can edit those files. They read they read right. Okay. So if you if you have a preliminary step where you can go in and hack on those files before they even get processed, surely that would be quite good, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be. <laughs> because because otherwise, at the moment, you need to if you want to change the modules. Um, so let's let's go to the second step. It's actually it's too late at this point. Um, the modules have already been loaded. So we go to the second step and we have a second shell. As it happens, there is actually currently there is a way in stage one of unsetting, I think, some of the modules. You can actually hack it in there. <laughs> I did make I did. I think I'm pretty certain I, I built the facility to hack it, to go in and hack it. But um, that's just actually more work well, than just editing the file before it gets loaded. <laughs> so <laughs> The second shell is good, like if you're trying to figure out what kernel modules are missing. Exactly. Uh, and you can uh, then, then load the kernel modules here if they're present on the file system, which often they are, not always. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, that yeah. another like shell at the beginning of all of it would be good because at this time, like you just have to boot the installer and kind of, uh, you know, if it can find everything, you know, you you try and change things around. But I don't know. Mm. So. Well, that's what I'm thinking because basically. If you, if for example, the, um, maybe we'll get to this later. I don't know, but the uh, one of the guys in the community was looking at um, uh, it has a rock pi for, so that uses the RK three three nine three three nine nine chipset, like the rock the rock Pro sixty four and a Pinebook Pro and many others do, uh, because it already uses that chipset. It, it wouldn't. I don't think it's actually going to be that much work to make it work on there because the kernel already supports the the, the, the sock. So you just it, it's just a case of what other modules does it need and do some other. Um, I mean, like for example, I don't know if the guys are watching it, but if you are, here you go. <laughs> it's kind of how it works. <laughs> but this is kind of like the idea of this project is like it's I've been I've created it this way so that other people can get involved with if they want to. You know, it's it's kind of a bit of a bit of fun to play around with. Um, so basically, oh, I've already done it actually. For the, I forgot about that. So I've, I've already added in support for the Rock Pi 4, just that it meets support in the sense that this particular script uh, will detect the Rock Pi 4 and it will, it will load currently the same modules as it does for the Pinebook Pro and the Rock Pro 64, because that will probably make it work. It might need some other modules or maybe one that needs removing, or I don't know, but that will probably make it work for the most part. So I was thinking, you know, uh, I say that because I was thinking, you know, if I can just add in this extra, uh, you know, um, let's say that he booted it and, for example, the modules, one of the modules causes it to kernel panic. I've seen that before on the Raspberry. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> if that's the case, you find that out and you think, OK, cool, let me reboot it, go into stage one of the boot, of pre boot shell, edit that file to just take that module out, press return, press a couple of times, and suddenly it's, it lights up without crashing. I think that would be, a, you know, quite a nice way of being able to more easily get Slackware working on, on other models. So I'm just kind of trying to add in extra, um, uh, you know, uh, tooling and, and um, sort of uh, pockets where you can hack on stuff that's important, uh, that's sort of in the, in the critical path of the boots. So yeah, I'll do that, Brent, because I looked at it, it's really easy. It's literally adding a read statement <laughs> and changing some of the text around. So, it's <laughs> yeah. so I'll add that in and, and just change the documentation. So let's let's boot the installer. Uh, we'll quit out of that shell. Uh, so this is, yeah, this is the Raspberry Pi 4. So yeah, basically what I've just showed you is we've booted the installer over the, so we've downloaded the installer over the network using TFTP. Uh, the same with the kernel and the same with the flattened device tree. So we've, we've assembled everything we need to boot and then we've, boot, we've uh, booted it from RAM. So I haven't touched the um, the uh, SD card on the Raspberry Pi 4. It's whatever was on there before. The only thing to point out this and with this, and this is caveated in the in the uh, in the text file in the readme, is that the installer you won't be able to install. Okay, so let's say that you had your Raspberry Pi 4 and it was already installed. If you rebooted into the installer over network, you wouldn't be able to install properly. Or I'm, actually, I haven't even tried it. I'm not going to bother because I know it won't work properly. <laughs> Basically, <sighs> the installer expects the SD card that's present to be configured in a, in a certain 
uh, in a certain way. It expects it to be from the factory. It expects it to be the Slackware installer, not a an operating systems boot partition, which is what it has become, because that's that's you know part of the installation process is to transition your Slackware installer. Uh, sorry, to transition your SD card from being the Slackware installer into being part in, into being the boot partition for your operating system. So when it doesn't find the installer parts, it will just won't work so well. <laughs> I haven't tested what exactly happened. It, I can just tell you it won't work. So that's the caveat of it. However, for me personally, it doesn't really matter because um, I'm not using it for that reason anyway. Uh, I'm just in, I'm just using it for um, for testing the kernel. So at this point, for example, if I wanted to reinstall. I just ins I just DD the Slackware installer, the regular image, onto the SD card and reboot it. That's what I would do. I don't know if that made any sense to anyone, but basically, anyway, <laughs> in a nutshell, this is a really good way of testing to see whether the kernel works. And in fact, as I said before, um, I can just test. Oh no, look, look, <laughs> no, hang on a minute, hold on, hang on, hang on. Is it the same version? Wait. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's, it's zero dot ten. So okay. So I've, I've been saying how amazing it is that it's been fixed. And there we go. You can see it's broken again. And all I've done is reboot it. OK, so this is what I'm talking about with the Raspberry Pi 4. <laughs> OK, so basically, uh, let's see. Is, is there any MMC? Yeah, there's still, it's still there. It's still there. So that's not, you know, it's seen worse days. It's still there. It's starting to think about just detaching. <laughs> <laughs> could be, could be. So yeah. <laughs> This is this is what's happening with the Raspberry Pi, and you compare it to the Rock Pro 64, and it works fine. So there we go. Let's move over to uh, something that works. So um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> so, yeah, it's disappointing because so much work has gone into the Raspberry Pi 4, and uh, I don't know. But. No, I mean to me, yeah, I know it, it's the same here. I mean, the good thing is, as I said, it's. Once you know, once they get there, if when they when it whenever it happens that the stars align and the code and, you know, <laughs> and it and it works, then everything is still in Slackware to make it work. Like it's great, yeah. that's fine. Um, but it you know, you know, it just it, then just they're just not there. They're not in part of the open you know the, the community ecosystem. That's it. That's that's where they're at. That's where the Raspberry yeah. Pi. Company is at where element fourteen is at. Uh, it's just the way they are. Looks it's like it's finished. <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, Not it's just the good. way that they're developing. Right? It's, their, it's their model. They're interested in making it work with their own versions of stuff, which doesn't include. You know, they, they don't. They're not worried about you know the kernel. They're just worried about it working on. Yeah. Products. That's it. So. Yeah, and I'm interested in having in the open source, you know, the, the, the mainstream community kernel running on the hardware device, the hardware model. That's what this is about. Um, so, yeah. But anyway, at least, again, yeah, it, there's a lot of work gone into that. But on the other hand, it'll just work later. It's not, you know, you guys will just have to keep, if 6.1 doesn't work well, you guys will just have to stay on 5.19 or perhaps build your own um, kernel from the uh, Raspberry Pi repo using the um, document that I wrote. That's another option as well, if you want to do that. Um, I guess I could probably update that document to see whatever the latest version of the kernel is the Raspberry Pi guys are using. Was it, was it, I think I had, was it 5.18 in the document? No, they're at 5.15. No, it can't be because I installed 5.19 on the. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Oh. Go to their GitHub. Yeah, it says in there in the the main branch that they're working on is 5.15.80. Um, hold on, now, because on GitHub. Hmm. Hold on. I don't think it was. They have other branches, but they're they're still mostly supporting. Huh. As far as I yeah, can yeah, tell. Look. So, so in this document here, this is the one that tells you how to build a, a proper Slackware kernel package from the Raspberry Pi kernel fork. This is here is 5.18. So yeah, yeah, that that was when that was the current uh, kernel that was out. That was uh, mainline too at the time. 
But if you look like on their GitHub, let's see, is there a chat in Skype? I can paste this to you. No, I should put I should put the um, URL of uh, of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you, yeah, okay. They actually had a, have a lot of branches. Yeah, so I can, if if 6.1 doesn't work well on the Raspberry Pi, I can just update this document and just say, you know, just build, just do it. I mean, it takes, you can just follow the documents. It doesn't take long. Um, oh, I'll to type 6.0. Okay, so they have a 6.0. A 6 so yeah, if they, if when 6.1 comes out, if, um, yeah, actually, that's not too bad. I, I, and they have a 6.1 too, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll look into it at the time. Hopefully 6.1 works better than 6.0 on the main and line. Originally, they were saying that kernel 5.2.0 was going to be the one where everything just works. And then 6.0 oh. started getting worked on instead. So that's there why it was a 5.2a, was there? 5.19. No, that was what it would have been, but it became a 6.0. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say, never take a dot zero release. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I don't. <laughs> well, that's not true. I took SACWare 15.0, but I knew about that. <laughs> uh -huh. So, but yeah. Um, all right. I'll look into that. But anyway, it's, it's something like that. Let's have a look at this. Okay, so we have just um so let me show you what i've been working on so i've just dd'd or just copied these the uh what's called the all-in-one slackware installer onto the mmc onto the sd card of my rock pro 64 so i'm just going to reboot this machine i'm going to this is destructive testing so this machine is basically useless now so um Rather, the operating system on it is, is useless because I've just ruined the boot partition and all the config for it. So, uh, so we just reboot this machine. So the Rock, uh, the Pinebook Pro, or rather the Rock Pro 64, uh, is booting now and should boot the Slackware like installer. Yeah. Oh, so the other thing I've done, Brent, is um, I have reduced the size of the Slackware uh, installer image by about 10 megabytes by switching the compression to LZMA on maximum compression, because previously oh. it was gzipped. So the installer boots slightly faster now because it simply doesn't take as long to load it off the storage or over the network. So it's smaller yeah. and I can't see any, I can't see any perceptible difference between how long it takes to unpack and boot, but it's definitely faster because it doesn't have to load as much data. Um, so I've been, oh yeah, so I've been playing around with this. Um, uh, one of the things, so, so yeah, the installer is now LZMA compressed. It makes it smaller, it's better. So that's good. What I started doing also was playing around with the operating system initial RAM disk manager tool, the OS initRT manager, because uh, I thought, let's see how long it takes to compress the OS initRD using LZMA. Because the installer, it doesn't matter because it runs on, on my build machine. So if it takes another, even if it took, even if it took like an extra 10 minutes, it really doesn't bother me because I'm not looking at it. For a user sitting in front of it, it would mean, you know, how long are they going to have to wait? How much longer are they going to have to wait? So I did some tests on it. And basically, when you use OS initRD manager using gzip, uh, gzip compression to compress the RAM disk, it takes about a minute or less to compress um, the, the RAM disk. When you use LZMA, it takes over three minutes, or more or less three. So I put the option, I put the ability in OSL, OS initRD manager to decompress either gzip or LZMA, but I haven't yet put the feet, I haven't put the ability for it to compress using LZMA, because I'm, I'm not really sure if the extra second or so it might, you know, uh, you know, the second or so it may take less to boot is actually worthwhile spending an extra two minutes watching it when you either upgrade a kernel package to the latest version or you, you know, you manage the initial RAM disk with the tool. I thought wasting an extra two or more minutes is really kind of, does it, it's counterintuitive really, isn't it? So yeah, there's a lot of other things you can do. 
in yes. two minutes. Yeah. So I, yes. I figured I won't introduce LZMA compression for OS init RD manager. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah. And also when you're doing a kernel upgrade, if it takes too long, you might think it's hung or broken or something like that as well. So you don't want to have, um, you know, you don't want to introduce too much uh, latency there. All right. So yeah, that's settled then. I won't add in, <laughs> I won't migrate to that. It doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, because it takes you two minutes every time you mess with it. And after a while, it's just so much time. It's a lot of time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a lot of time. I mean, I could make it. I could make it an option to use one or the other, but it's not really worth it, is it? I mean, it takes an extra ten megabytes on the SD card. Who cares? It's massive. You've got a massive partition anyway. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so especially when you've got the all-in-one installer. Ah, uh, here we go. That's great. We've gone back to the topic. Thanks, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> you all into one installer. Okay, let's just let's just make sure the Rock Pro 64 hasn't exploded. Good. No, there's no errors in the message that we care about. Okay. Um, so the all-in-one installer. What is the all-in-one installer? Well, it's basically. Um, let's show you the all-in-one installer. So this machine has already got a. It's already set up. It's got a. Uh, you know, it's got a swap partition, which is rid ridiculously large. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty certain I have used a lot of swap in the past. On ARM, I used to, you know, used to use all the swap I could, I could give it. Um, building Firefox, anyway, we're not used to build. Um, but yeah, we've got our swap partition. We've got the OS, uh, the partition we're going to put everything on uh, for the OS. So let's run setup and let's see what's going on. All right. So we're going to quickly walk through this. So we'll add our swap. Well, I don't need to set a key map because you don't need to do that over the serial port. Um, so let's do that. OK. And let's partition every, uh, let's uh, format the partition for the root. So again, I'm just kind of blowing away this machine. It's just a test machine. <laughs> OK. Blast it away. Like a mother crusher on a hard ass day. <laughs> I love, I love uh, like some of the, the rappers and, their, and their, their rap lyrics. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, we, OK, this is one thing. Oh, yeah, this has been on my list of fix for ages is the formatting. I'm aware that it has, um, uh, the formatting gets messed up here. It is possible to fix this, but I just haven't fixed it. It was one of those bugs I found during development and I hacked on it and couldn't fix it. I thought I'll return to that at some point when it really annoys me. But yeah, <laughs> it's supposed to be all lined up. Anyway, um, so this is our FS tab. So it's got the boot partition, which is on the SD card and the root partition is on the, uh, what do we have on this one? Oh, it's a, uh, it's uh, it's an SSD drive um, made available over a USB to SATA port. Right, so that's there. Here we go. This is the new part. So ordinarily in Slackware, you'd now be presented with a, with a uh, a dialog box um, that. Uh, oh, by the way, the colors are all messed up because of the, the the terminal settings. I haven't fixed it. It should be all of this should be block solid, solid colors. Um, so ordinarily in Slackware at this point, it asks you where, where is your where is your store? You know, where's your um, Slackware media? Where are the packages for me to to uh, to install? And you have several options. Uh, you can install. Uh, it can uh, locate a CD or a DVD if it's connected to. You know, if you've got uh, optical media, it can use. Uh, it can find it, uh, packages on a USB stick. What else is there? There's there's HTTP. There's NFS. Is there another one? Can't remember. Uh, falling from a thumb drive, uh, DVD. I yeah, don't know that, if that's in there. <laughs> yeah, I've mentioned those ones. Yeah, it's got the optical. Anyway, so it's got it's got <clears> options <throat> where you have to tell it where is your media. So Brent had this idea. Why don't we just put the because um, we're booting off the SD card anyway, and we've got plenty of space on the SD card because we we sort of mandate I think a minimum of sixteen gig or is it eight? I can't remember. It's going to be sixteen gig if it's not already. Um, we're going to man. We you know we mandate. Could you, the, you know, the the minimum SD card size or capacity we say you need is 16 gig. And what that gives you is a whole load of space to play with, right? And the reason why it's that is because you could say, oh, well, actually, we could get away with a couple of gigs. But you can't even buy SD cards that are that, 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 that such low capacity anyway anymore. And if you can, they're the same price as buying one with a big capacity. So yeah. uh, the choice is, OK, go for minimum. You can get... For example, this one has a, maybe a 64 gig part, uh, 64 gig SD card in it, or maybe 32. I don't know. 
But anyway, we've got loads of space available to us, is what we're saying. Why don't we package all of the Slackware, uh, the packages and the installer in one package? Because at the moment in the installer, what you need to do, uh, or rather it, uh, in the installation documents, you need to download the installer, you need to write it to the SD card, then you need to download with rsync all of the packages, and then you need to either put them somewhere to make them available over um, HTTP, like on a local, you know, on your local network, um, or you have to make them available over NFS, or you have to put them on a USB stick and then plug that into the USB port, which on the Raspberry Pi only has one USB 3 port. In fact, so does the Rock Pro 64, to be fair. They only have one USB 3 port, right, which is the fast one. And in the case of, you know, the Raspberry Pi 4, uh, where are you going to put your storage? Well, I, you know, SD card is a bad idea, although some people disagree with me. That's great. <laughs> we'll always disagree. Um, <laughs> that's never going to change, trust me. Uh, that's a bad idea, in my opinion, but you can do it. But, but if that's not the case, you know, in the way that I've um, designed it is that it goes on to uh, storage, which you connect to a USB port, uh, sorry, the USB 3 port, and you put it on a SD card or something like that. Sorry, <laughs> no, you put it on an SSD drive, which is what I've done, or an NVMe in a, in a caddy or whatever. So the question then is, well, okay, it's going to take longer to, to install over, the, even, if you, even if you put the packages on a USB stick, then it's going to take ages. The thing, so the thing is, is why don't we just put it all on one big package? And then all you need to do is you just download one single image. It's 10, well, uh, it compresses to about four and a half gigabytes. So you'll download a four and a half gig image file, single file. You'll DD it, you, you know, you'll dump it onto your SD card and then you'll just boot it. And then this will happen. So you'll run through the installer, you'll get to this. Um, you can answer no if you want, and then that will take you immediately to the Slackware, the regular uh, uh, media selection menu. Or you press yes, and that's it. And then you move straight into okay. selecting the packages you want. So um, yeah, that's it really. So if I, you know, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I'm, if I, oh, actually, no, it's already changed the config. But basically, yeah, that's it. And then um, oh, I shouldn't have done that, should I? Because uh, oh no, it's fine. It's fine. But you. I was going to show you it installed it, but there's no point. Basically, you press enter and it just installs, and then it re and then it it just proceeds through, and you reboot, and that's it. So, um, actually, I suppose we could see what happens if you do it again. Oh, I'll show you. Yes, what happens if you run this again, and you go back to let's go back to uh, select source media. Oops. Oh, that's fine. There you go. Oh yeah. So I need to redo that. Okay. So let's do that again. I think that might Let's see what that does. Ah, yeah, because it's already mounted. Yeah. Okay, and then let's see. It might break with that. Oh, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, this is sometimes what happens in the installer. If you've gone through a certain point and you've and you've bailed out of it, yeah, you, you some of the, the settings get messed up and you have to reboot, but that's okay. Um, but let's see, actually, I could just reboot it. Because the only thing that it actually changes is this. So let's have a look. When you, oops, and then you go into here. Have I actually got nano in here? Oh yeah, it actually does. Right, so just take this out. Oh, that's default OS. Because um, that hasn't been removed. There we go. The, the installer will actually fix part of that, but. To reboot this to see what it does. I've already tested it, it all works fine when you go through it, but basically that's it. So you'll you'll just have this single image like this, you'll boot it up, and then you'll be able to start installing it. Oh, the other thing, I don't know if you noticed, Brent, um, if you were paying that much attention to what was going on there, but basically did you notice that it didn't re it didn't offer to resize slash boot anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> good. Yeah, this uh, what I was doing, I was dumping uh, onto my SD card you know, the, the repo, but leaving space for it to resize so it wouldn't mess up. <laughs> right, okay. This will, now, I mean, it couldn't resize anyway because it's got an extra partition on the SD yeah. to contain all the packages. But even in the regular installer without, you know, the, the bare installer, um, which uh, even with that, I've completely removed the option now because it just didn't make any sense. When I, when I developed it, I thought, oh, yeah, you know, 
we could it can easily make all of the storage available to the users by just offering to resize slash boots right it just seemed like a really a pretty brilliant idea um and it's a nice idea with good intentions but actually completely you know totally misguided like, <laughs> armbian has a way they have like a resize command that just fixes your sd card but well, they make a lot of decisions for you before you uh you know you've even installed everything so yeah so the, the thing is though is on the on the yeah I'm, I'm not too keen on making lots of decisions for users i'll talk about that more in a moment actually but on the on the on the slash boot thing the, re, the resize option it just didn't make any sense because i was t i was advocating not install you know not using the sd card too much because you wear them out um that's why that's why not even if you even if you mount it with no a time to reduce the writes and stuff if you start heavily writing to this thing it will just break and you get no notice and the things won't boot anymore like that's been it doesn't nice. happen on the raspberry pi though because it just doesn't like to mount it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right come on stab it come on <laughs> get, get that frustration out um no they're right <laughs> but throw it in a microwave and you're done <laughs> yeah pretty that would um uh uh, yeah, so I was advocating, I was advocating not to, you know, not to store stuff. Don't use, don't use uh, the SD cards too much because you'll wear them out. So, that, you know, it's not great. But then I was, I was saying, you know, you can resize the boot partition, which encourages people to put unrelated assets into slash boot. Where actually, really, it needs to be reserved for stuff to do with slash boot. So that was just to completely, like, I just really, it, it was a great idea, but I thought in ret in hindsight that didn't make any sense. That was just a bad idea. So. Um, I've taken that out. I did, however, think about, let's just run through this again. I did just think about, um, uh, I'll sh yeah, I'll show you this in a moment. Okay, so yeah, and then we just select everything and then it starts to install, okay. So that's now gonna install and it's taking all the packages off of the, um, the partition that's uh, included on the SD card, and it's just going to install onto, in this case, an SSD drive that's connected to the Raspberry Pi. So if I show you, though, just give you what's going on here. Uh, oh, no, it's... Um, okay, so this is... I've now SSH'd into the installer running on the Raspberry Pi. Um, <laughs> just so... Um, just one of the things I'm going to point out, actually, I don't know if uh, I haven't really thought too much about what to do with this, but basically, uh, when you saw me SSH, in fact, I'll do it again. So I'll SSH in. I'm not entering a password. I'm just hitting enter. So the, the Slackware installer, by default, has no root password. Now, this is great for local installations because you don't. there's no point in having a root password. You just press enter. You're the only one there, right? So that doesn't make sense. <laughs> But over the network, uh, that's obviously not a good idea. And when um, Darren Austin and myself, um, as I said on the previous uh, vlog, uh, Akamai have given us some compute on Linode. And so uh, Darren runs the slackware.uk site, uh, the FTP site and you know, distribution site. And so uh, we've got him set up with some stuff on, on there. And uh, Linode have their own Slackware image. So it makes it really easy to deploy um, Slackware on Linode, you literally just go and select it out of all of the distributions and just deploy it. So I, uh, Brent and I have got a server that we use to share some stuff in Linode um, for this project. Um, really easy, and we're using their image. Now, <laughs> Darren was not interested in their image. <laughs> Darren wanted to use the Slackware installer, like me, really, but I hadn't gone to the effort of figuring out how to do it. <laughs> Darren, it took Darren about half an hour, and he was the Slackware installer was booted. And one of the things he realized was that, uh, you know, because there's no password, um, we knew that, but, but you know, when you put a machine on the internet, that's not a good idea. And so people <laughs> are trying to break into the machine without with a root password. Anyway, the point, the, the, the story is, um, at the moment, uh, what, 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 so therefore what I did was inside the installer, and this is for Slackware x86 as well as ARM, you can now, there is a, there is a kernel parameter that you can set to configure the Slackware root, uh, the root password for the Slackware installer. 
So in other words, it's not open to the internet. You've got a, a password of your own choosing. And you can do that with a, you can do that with ARH64 as well. I just haven't yet because I thought, well, I could just set a default root password and publish it in the documentation and then just kind of people could hopefully boot the machine and change the password if they needed to before someone hacked it. <laughs> but then I thought like it would just end up in a dictionary with some other password, default root passwords, and they'd probably get pwned anyway. <laughs> so I thought, what's this is kind of like, what's the point in that? So I haven't done that. So anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, well, what, yeah. what is the solution to that problem? Like, you either disable networking. Um, you know, actually, maybe maybe that's what. It, no, I was going to say I could do that. Actually, that would be the solution because with the all in one in the all in one installer, the way I've documented it, actually, you're supposed to sit at it and install it. But and but even the way which is fine. But even the way that I do it, I I do you know, for example this build machine or the build machines are all accessed remotely. So I do all of the reinstallations exactly as I'm showing you guys now. I do it over the serial ports. I only use I only use the keyboard and monitor when I'm just testing it for a, you know a major upgrade or something like that. But even if I do it over the serial port, and I disable the the I, do, I disable SSH. Uh, it still works for me because I'm using a serial port. I don't. I never SSH into it, or hardly ever into the installer. And I don't need. I don't need networking. Hmm. Let me think. Yeah, I don't know. Or do you? No, no, I don't, not really. No, apart from well, I do because I set the time on the machine. But networking's not the same. I mean, SSH is independent from networking, so I could probably just disable the SSH. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. I'm not. I'm not. A, the thing is, I do SSH into it from time to time because it's useful. But yeah. copying then, files, especially. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll just put it as a warning. Like you know, you can if you want to, you can mount your SD card and change the password by setting it like this. It's easy enough to do within Linux, isn't it? To just mount the SD card image you've just made. Maybe that's what I'll, I'll do instead. If that's be. Yeah. Because for me, it's not a concern, right? I'm not concerned about anyone on the network SSHing into this installer because it's, like, it's on the LAN. But you know, when we when we put these machines on Linode, <laughs> you yeah, right. People like the network the is so the there's Slack so Barry's many people install. hacking on Linode. Oh yeah, you know the the Slackberry's in, installer was literally exposed to the public internet. So uh, we, we picked, <laughs> so I, that's why I coded it in quickly into the installer and we got that into the uh, into the project. But um, you know, it's it's not as a you know it's a known it's, it's known anyway. Um, back to this right. So what what are, what are we doing here? So basically, uh, I'm actually in the right machine. Uh, hold on. Oh, sorry, no, I'm not. <laughs> I've SSH'd into the wrong machine. This is actually the Raspberry Pi, isn't it? The one where we booted the installer over the um we can see let's look in the d message oh yeah there we go <laughs> <laughs> of course it's, it's it's actually pepper ah of course uh, i just uh, delete everything yeah uh, there's nothing important <laughs> no. this is my ordinarily folks you wouldn't do that <laughs> but these are just <laughs> this is my development machine and i really do know that there's nothing in there so what are we looking at here um, so again, this, this here is the SSD card, and these are the partitions on it. One, uh, there's two partitions for the Rock Pro 64. You've got where the installer is located, and then you've got all the partition. Sorry, you've got the, the partition here, which contains all of the, uh, the Slackware media. And there, that's it. So basically, yeah, that, that's it. That's how it works. It just finds it on there and installs it from there. I did think about making it um, uh, yeah, so in the same way as we resized slash boot previously, I thought about resizing this automatically or offering it, but then I thought, you know what, actually it's not worth it. The, the user can boot, if they ever want to do anything with it, they can delete it, they can, you know, because it, it's got a label on it as well. So this is one of the, what the ways that it's sanity checked and, and discovered within the installer, right? It has this label. So if you're going to use it for yourself, you're going to want to relabel it. And, and in which case, why don't you just recreate the file system? Just sorry, recreate the partition. You know, yeah. recreate. You know, I, I didn't see the point in doing it, so I, I haven't decided to resize it or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's going to be. I'll make a note in the new documentation to do to. You know, you can mount it or you can do whatever you want with it. 
uh, upon upon uh, installation of the OS. So I'm going to change the documentation now. So all the documentation will uh, point to these all-in-one installers. Well, okay, it works pretty good. That's yeah, that's what I've been working on over the last few weeks during uh, uh, whilst waiting for Linux 6.1 to arrive. That's kind of it. <laughs> that's been uh, how long have we been talking for now? Quite a while. A while, very while, long while. All right. Um, hour and fourteen minutes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I don't have a hard stop, but we're going to have quite a long podcast, I think. Uh, should we have a look? Do you want to have a look at this, the stuff you've done now with the honeycomb, or should we do that next time? Next time, it's it's just on the verge of being completely finished. So. Okay. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, it still works with the UEFI and the bootloader from uh, Solid Run, but I'd like to compile it on Slackware and use it that way. So yeah, right, yeah. right now I'm just trying to figure out um, what needs to go where on the SD card because there's like 10 files that they DD over in their crazy script. <laughs> You've seen it. You know my pain. So is it a case of their... DDing files into, you know, onto a particular uh, area of the SD card rather than putting it inside a file system. Yeah, they're using, it's very, it's like they started writing it and they just keep adding little bits to make it work. It doesn't, <laughs> um, they use build root to build a bunch of stuff and I've been trying to just like copy the stuff we need uh, from the packages we've already built. But I finally got past the part where I got ATF to build the uh, ARM trusted firmware and everything else is pretty easy after that. I just have to do it. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about that another time then in the next mm -hmm. podcast. But yeah, so that's, that's, um, that's, uh, I think that'll be it for this podcast. So we've talked about the installer, how you can now boot that over the TFTP. And then with when we release Linux 6.1, um, I will probably short quite shortly afterwards, I'll release these new all-in-one um, installers as well and uh, get some testing on those. It all seems to work for me, so it should be all good for everyone. I think that's about it, really. Yeah. All good. We've that. been kind of, you've been working a lot, and I've been dealing with sick family, <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh God! Yeah, not a it. whole lot of extra stuff has been done. <laughs> no, well, yeah. I mean, the thing is, that this this kind of work this work actually takes quite a bit of time to develop it. It may seem like it's quite a small thing just to have this, but actually having setting up the um, you know just writing all of the extra the uh, script code to be able to modify the uh, the images and copy everything on, and then write the code to to find the partition. It sounds like it's quite straightforward, but actually just testing it and making it. Uh, getting it all working is it takes quite a while as well. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, the you get thing, it just right, you don't have to look at it for a long time. So it's like, yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, I had the other option as well, as well initially, I'd made it so that that screen showed you, it just said, you know, the installer is ready to use here, it's done, it's mounted. But then I thought, why don't I just offer the option to install, to, to you know, to uh, be immediately presented with the, uh, um, uh, the list of options, you know, install target options like you used to do. So, for example, if you decided that you wanted, you, you know, you've got an older version of the installer image, but you wanted to install off uh, a, a tree over the network, which is more up to date, you could just say, no, I don't want to use the bundled image. I want to go and install over NFS because I thought that's something you could do, something I might do. So I've added that in as well. Oh, the other thing is I want to see if we can get this into x86 as well, because I think that you know, most of the time these days, I don't think you can buy x86-64 hardware with optical media. I mean, no. you probably can, <coughs> excuse me, but most of the time it doesn't come with optical media or optical drive rather. Um, so, I mean, to me, it would make more sense to just ship USB images like this, like we're going to do with SD cards. So I can I can provide Pat this, the, the, um, the new version of, the, you know, the script that does that uh, all in one stuff, but I also need to patch the um, probe tool to filter out the uh, 
these new reserved partition names or the rather file system names so they don't get offered up as um you know being install targets when it actually contains the packages <laughs> so i need to patch that because that's uh i need to do that for x86 but i think that's a good idea i quite i like this development i think it makes a lot of sense with what um with the environment in which you know uh, it simplifies the installer there's less to do there's less actual things to type um, so it's quite a nice improvement I'm yeah. happy with that. <laughs> all right cool well, anyway thanks a lot guys if you if you've uh, made it this far through to this uh, really rather long podcast um thanks again for your support uh, thanks for the donations to help keep the uh, systems spinning and um we'll see you in the next one and thanks for your help as well brent i'll, yeah. I'll talk to you later on all right see you later